Okay, so welcome to the Hedel Brown Harvey Postdoctoral Seminar Series. My name is Alicia Corsi, and I'm a postdoc at the Sowers Institute for Medical Research. And uh, we'll be moderating today with uh, Jacun Chen, a postdoc at the Volume Institute at Oregon Health and Science University. We are excited to highlight the work of our outstanding postdoctoral members. Today, Josh Abrams from Skirball Institute at New York University School of Medicine and Kate Criswell from University of Cambridge will share the research. Each speaker will give a 20 minute talk uh, followed by 10 minutes of Q&A. Please uh, enter your questions uh, in the Zoom uh, Q&A box. Now it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Josh uh, Abrams. Josh uh, obtained his PhD at the University of Pennsylvania, where he studied uh, how the modulation of smooth uh, muscle contraction uh, induces epithelial cell invasion. Now he's a postdoc uh, in Dr. Jeremy Nance's uh, lab at Skirball Institute uh, at the New York University School of Medicine. And he's working uh, on uh, understanding the process of intracellular tube extensions. The relevance of his work was recognized by multiple awards uh, and by fellowships from the American Cancer Society and the NIH. Josh not only is a brilliant cellular biologist, but also a dedicated mentor for the next generation of scientists. He was an academic mentor for the program Choose Development and TA for several years in different courses. Today, Josh will be presenting his current postdoctoral work on a polarity pathway for exosis dependent intracellular tube extension. So without further, further ado, I present Dr. Josh Abrams. Okay, I'm just gonna share my screen. Okay, hopefully you can all see that. Um, thank you, Alicia, for that kind introduction. Um, and thank you all for attending today on this sunny, temperate uh, Friday afternoon, at least where I am in New York it is. Um, and um, yeah, I look forward to sharing my work with you, my postdoctoral work with you on the mechanisms of tube formation. Uh, so most of our major organs are actually composed of a network of many tubes. And the function of these tubes is required to transport gases and fluids from one site to another uh, within our bodies. But uh, despite this important function, a detailed molecular understanding of what regulates the size, shape, and overall growth of particular tubes uh, still remains unclear. So uh, for my talk today, I'm going to tell you about a tube that we are really interested in, a unique type of tube that forms in C. elegans. And this is the C. elegans excretory cell shown here in magenta. And this, uh, this tube does something really fascinating because it actually has to form a hollow lumen within the center of its own cell. And this is called intracellular tube formation. So um, hopefully I'll be able to tell you why this is an exciting model to try and understand why uh, uh, the mechanisms of this process. So um, single cell intracellular tubes have actually been described in other developmental systems. For example, in the fly tracheal system, there's this highly branched network of tubes that are critical for fly respiration. And at the very tips of these branches are single cell tubes that form an intracellular lumen. Also in vertebrates, such as the zebrafish, the beautiful uh, zebrafish vasculature, there are tiny capillaries that are unicellular and they're required to form sort of a bridge between the rest of the vascular network. And in our favorite model system, the C. elegans, um, the um, C. elegans excretory cell forms this large H shape that spans the entire length of the adult stage worm shown here. And this is critical for the worm's osmoregulation. So you can see that the nucleus of the cell is located here, and there are two anterior and two posterior extensions that ultimately hollow out and form intracellular tubes. So with this as our model, uh, we're really interested in understanding the molecular mechanisms that regulate this intracellular uh, uh, tube formation. So one clue that uh, our lab 
and other other the and the Lab OS and Gobel labs also observed several years ago was that uh, when you do an electron uh, uh, when you take an electron microscopy image of a of a single slice across the larval stage excretory cell, uh, you observe these really fascinating and large vesicles that are filling the cytoplasm of the cell. <clears throat> and when we looked a little more closely, it was appreciated that several of these vesicles are actually in direct contact with the membrane surrounding the lumen in the center, but the vesicles were never observed to be in contact with the outer basal membrane. So that suggested that something must be directing the vesicles specifically to this membrane. We hypothesized that that directionality was also linked to the, the growth and expansion of the tube in that the vesicles could be providing additional membrane to allow the, the structure to grow out. Um, so to actually investigate this, we decided to look at a protein complex called the exocyst. And the reason we chose the exocyst is because it's a highly conserved protein complex from yeast to mammals. And in, in all these systems, it performs the same function where it actually brings secretory vesicles to particular membranes and allows them to properly fuse. Um, so the protein complex is shown here in purple. It's made up of eight individual proteins. And there's also a small GTPase called RAL1, which I will discuss uh, towards the end of my talk. So with that as background, the, the main things I'd like to discuss in my talk today are first, what is the role of the exocyst in the growth of single cell tubes? And secondly, how is the exocyst itself regulated? And for that, I'll talk a little bit about the PAR polarity complex. And finally, what are additional mechanisms that could be functioning in this pathway to uh, regulate the polarization and the normal growth of single cell tubes? So for the first part, um, we looked more closely at the exocyst within this system. And the first thing we did was simply to endogenously tag one of the core components of the exocyst. So that's a protein called SEC5, which here has a YFP tag on it. And um, in this image and all the others, I'll show you the dotted line at the edge simply represents the outer edge of the cytoplasm of the canal cell. So this is a zoomed in region of a uh, larval stage excretory cell. And hopefully you can appreciate there's this punctate pattern that's enriched at the luminal membrane. Where, the, where we observe exocysts in this, uh, in this image. And that would correspond with the luminal membrane where the vesicles are being tethered. So that was exciting because it suggests that the exocyst was at least in the right place to be performing such a function. Um, next, we actually wanted to test the role of exocyst within single cell tubes. And for this, we had a, a bit of a problem because all of the exocyst mutants in any of the exocyst proteins are embryonic lethal. So we needed to utilize a strategy to deplete particular proteins acutely. And for this, we turned to a Degron method that was previously developed in our lab, where you can take a small Degron called ZF1 and endogenously tag a target protein. And then you can, you can re-express the adapter called ZIF1, either in a specific tissue or using a heat shock to express it at a particular time point. And when the adapter recognizes ZF1 tagged protein, we get very rapid protein degradation. So we wanted to take advantage of this strategy to then uh, determine the role of exocyst within the excretory cell. So this is the experiment. Um, and this is an example of a control larvae where the cell body is shown by this asterisk and one arm of the excretory canal that's growing towards the posterior is shown here and ultimately grows out of this particular image. So then what happens if we actually degrade exocyst protein just within the cell? Well, what we see is this very severe growth defect where the canal cell is severely truncated. And if you look more closely um, using markers for the lumen and the cytoplasm, we observed these not only severe growth defects, but also luminal defects where the lumen appears to be cystic and uh, not sort of the characteristic smooth architecture of a uh, control animal. So this told us that the exodus was indeed required for normal tube growth in the cell. But uh, the next question we really wanted to try and drill down to is how does the exocyst actually get directed to that membrane to get that very nice um, characteristic expression along the lumen? And uh, so for that, we wanted to look more closely at PAR proteins with the hypothesis that perhaps the luminal membrane was 
polarized uh, uh, based on the function, the activity of PAR protein. So PAR proteins are another highly conserved protein complex that uh, was initially characterized in pioneering C. elegans screens for its role in early, uh, early, um, early cell divisions and uh, cell polarity. And uh, it's uh, been shown that PAR proteins are also key in many other cell types. Um, a lot has been studied on uh, specifically epithelia. And um, the set of PAR proteins I'm gonna focus on are the, ape, are the PAR proteins associated with apical character, generally speaking, and that's PAR3, PAR6, and a kinase called PKC3 or APKC in mammals. Um, and so we wanted to see if these PAR proteins could be creating sort of an apical domain at the lumen, and that was allowing the exocyst to find that proper membrane. Um, so just like exocyst, we started out by endogenously tagging all three of these proteins. And uh, we were very happy to see that the localization looks very similar in all three, where they're enriched at the luminal membrane, right where the exocyst is located, suggesting that the PAR proteins may be interfacing with the exocyst at that domain. And then we repeated the same tissue specific degradation experiments by degrading PAR6 and its binding partner PKC3. And we saw very similar to exocyst that there were growth defects of the canal and also uh, various lumen abnormalities that resembled what we saw with the exocyst. Um, I'm not going to show you the data for PAR3 because interestingly, PAR3 looked just like the wild type and, and it didn't have a phenotype, which is uh, something that we're still following up on, um, but it sort of suggests that these PAR proteins can function distinctly depending on the context or the particular cell type. So the real experiment that we wanted to do to test the genetic relationship between PAR proteins and exocyst was to uh, uh, degrade PAR proteins and then look at what happens to exocyst. And, and so to do this, we had to modify our protein degradation strategy. So instead of degrading in tissue specific manner, uh, where we're gonna get these morphological defects, we took advantage of the heat shock approach where we can let the cell grow out normally and then deplete a particular protein of interest and examine the localization of uh, exocyst, for example. So here I'm just showing you a, a control animal where we have a ZF1 YFP tag throughout the entire animal. Uh, and I'm just showing you the canal here. Then if we pro provide a short heat shock pulse, we see that the signal is rapidly lost and that's quantified here. So that showed us that this method would be uh, very useful to use for these types of experiments. So the actual experiment is to take out PAR6. So this is the experimental setup to remove PAR6 and examine what happens to exocyst at the luminal membrane. And so for these uh, heat shock experiments, we measure the localization in a couple different ways. So this plots are transects across the cell where you can see two peaks of intensity resembling the uh, uh, intensity of PAR6 and exocyst respectively. So they're both lining up at the luminal membrane. The other way I'll show the data is I lumen to cytoplasm ratio by just taking measurements along the luminal membrane and within the cytoplasm and creating a ratio, which is gonna look like this with each color representing a different uh, biological replicate. So this is the control group. And so then for the experiment, we would either expect that if there was no effect, uh, that the ratio would look the same as the control, it wouldn't change. Uh, but if there was in fact a role for PAR6 in regulating exocyst, we would see a decrease uh, corresponding to more exocyst being in the cytoplasm relative to the lumen. And so indeed, when we do the experiment, we lose PAR6 and we see exocyst is no longer enriched at the luminal membrane. And you can appreciate that in this graph and also the corresponding decrease in the lumen to cytoplasm ratio. <clears throat> so that told us that PAR6 is indeed required for exocyst localization. Interestingly, when we looked at PAR3, which I briefly mentioned earlier, doesn't have a role in the, uh, a phenotypic role in the outgrowth of the canal cell, we actually see no effect on exocyst localization. So it still remains at the lumen, which you can appreciate here, and by the lack of a change of the lumen to cytoplasm ratio. So um, sort of piecing that into this pathway, it tells us that PAR6 and its binding partner, PKC3, are playing a role in localizing exocysts to the membrane, but PAR3 seems to be acting independently. And that's uh, something that we're still following up on exactly how, what if anything PAR3 is doing within the cell. 
So then we wanted to actually determine what's functioning upstream of PAR6 and PKC3 to set up the polarization within the cell. And so for this, we looked more closely at the small JTPA CDC42, which has a known role uh, in its active form, I should say. It has a known role in regulating PAR6 and PKC3 in, in various cellular contexts. Um, in data I don't have time to show, we did do a heat shock degradation of CDC42 and saw that there was a, decrease, uh, a loss of PAR6 at the luminal membrane, suggesting that CDC42 does regulate PAR6 within the cell. But what we really wanted to follow up on is how is CDC42 regulated? So as a small GTPase, there are GEFs and gaps that can turn the, that can tune the activity of CDC42. And as it turned out, there was a particular GEF called EXC5 or FGD in mammals that uh, had been shown in culture to be a regulator of CDC42 activity. And there was also a, a report that uh, EXC5 was expressed in the excretory cell. So we wondered, could EXC5 be the uh, activator of CDC42 at the luminal membrane, which would enable PAR6 and PKC3 to be brought uh, to that site? So for this experiment, we generated a tagged version of EXC5 with a ZF1 Degron tag. And the first observation that was important was that EXC5 was indeed enriched at the luminal membrane in sort of a punctate pattern, suggesting that that might be sites where it's able to um, regulate CDC42. And in this experiment, I'm then looking at the uh, PKC3 localization in response to EXC5 degradation. So in a control, they both localize nicely at the luminal membrane. But when we degrade EXC5 with, with our heat shock approach, we lose the PKC3 uh, enrichment at the membrane, uh, which you can appreciate by the significant decrease of the lumen to cytoplasm ratio as well. So taken together, that, that uh, sort of puts together this proposed pathway for how these single cell tubes are actually growing and expanding within, uh, at least within the C. elegans excretory cell. So, so far at the top of the pathway, we have the ROGEF EXC5, which we propose is activating CDC42 at the luminal membrane. <clears throat> and that's recruiting PAR6 and its binding partner PKC3 to this membrane, allowing for exorcist activity at that site, and ultimately the recruitment of these, these um, cytoplasmic vesicles to enable them to fuse along the luminal membrane as it is growing and expanding. And I mentioned that, yeah, from what we know so far, PAR3 is clearly not required for exorcist recruitment in the canal cell. Um, and there was some evidence from cell culture that PAR3 could interface with uh, uh, various members of the exorcist complex. So this suggests that in different cellular contexts, the PAR proteins could interface with exorcists in, uh, in different ways. Um, and we are further investigating PAR3 potentially for a role in the early outgrowth of the excretory cell, but we don't yet know uh, if, if it's important in that context. Um, so for the last few minutes, I just want to talk about some of the next steps that we're pursuing in examining this pathway. So a couple of key questions remain. So one is, so far we have EXC5 at the top of the pathway, but what actually regulates EXC5 to get it to the luminal membrane? Um, and we have um, some evidence that it, it um, could be directly binding to particular phospholipid domains just based on the structure of, EK, uh, of uh, EXC5. And um, that's something we're going to be further investigating. And what I'll talk about a little bit at the end here is we're interested in understanding a little bit more about this RAL1 GTPase that I alluded to at the beginning, because it's an activator of the excess complex. And there's some data from um, some biochemical data that PAR6 can, in fact, interact with, uh, with RAL1 in mammalian cells. So we thought perhaps PAR6 could either directly regulate excess or it could be activating RAL1 somehow. And that RAL activity is, is then enabling excess to get to the membrane. So, um, uh, just to show you some of the data we so far have on the role of RAL1 is um, when we deplete RAL1 from the canal cell, just like we did with exorcist, we see a very similar phenotype where there's this severe excretory cell truncation. And we see these, these luminal abnormalities that, that resemble what we saw with the exorcist. So that suggests that exorcist and RAL, RAL1 could indeed be regulating exorcist within the cell. 
But we wanted to test that more directly using our, our heat shock approach. So we, we generated a tagged allele of RAL1 with a YFP and a ZF1 tag. And uh, the first thing you can appreciate is it's more broadly expressed than a lot of the other components that I showed you. And for a small GTPase, this could suggest that the active form might be enriched at the luminal membrane and the total RAL could be more diffuse within the cytoplasm. And that's, that's something we're still investigating. Um, but basically, when we went into degrade RAL, the first interesting thing that happened was actually we, we were not able to degrade it completely. Um, this is the first protein in our hands that we haven't been able to degrade completely. And, and it turns out from the literature from um, Michelle Laboes's group has shown that RAL1 plays a role in a multivesicular body formation. So we think that this population that is not accessible to degradation is stored within multivesicular bodies, and that's protecting the protein from degradation. But we still do get about 60% when we just measure the loss of fluorescence. So we, so we pursued this to look at what happens to exosis when we take out RAL1. And so this is the experiment. It's very similar setup to the heat shock experiments I showed you before. We have RAL1 and um, exosis marked. You can maybe appreciate that in these traces, exosis seems a little more luminally enriched compared to total RAL1. When we deplete RAL1 with the heat shock, or at least much of RAL1, obviously it's not all gone, but we actually still do see a pretty dramatic effect where, where the exosist is lost. And you can appreciate that in these lumen to cytoplasm uh, quantifications. So that told us that RAL certainly seems to be critical for exosist positioning within the excretory cell. Um, and the final piece of data I want to show you is just, we, we looked at- One um, minute left. Okay, thank you. Uh, so in this final piece of data, we looked at an endogenously tagged form of the lone RAL GEF in C. elegans. So we think this would be the lone regulator, uh, the lone activator of RAL. So I'm just showing you an image of RAL1, which I already showed you is pretty diffuse within the cell. But when we look at endogenously tagged um, RGL1, the RAL GEF, we were very excited to see that it's enriched only at the luminal membrane where exosist and PAR6 are also located. So the experiment that I'm doing right now is to deplete PAR6 and examine what happens to RGL1 localization. And that might provide a link between PAR proteins and RAL activation. So um, stay tuned for that. And uh, I'm hoping to have that data in the near future. So this is the model of what I've shown you today. We, we have this proposed pathway for intracellular tube expansion. And uh, we're currently investigating the additional inputs that regulate EXT5 and connect PAR proteins to exosist potentially via RAL1. Um, so with that, I want to thank the members of the Nance Lab, past and present, uh, especially Jeremy Nance, for his exceptional mentorship throughout this project. Um, we've received strains from the highly collaborative C. elegans community that were used in this study. My funding sources are shown here. Uh, also, past and present members of the Skirball Institute for their helpful insights into this project. Um, and uh, thank you all for your attention. I'd be happy to answer your questions. And uh, I've left my contact information here for any questions that I don't get to. So uh, thank you all for your attention. Thank you so much, Joshua. That was, that was great. <laughs> it was a very interesting story. Uh, so if anybody has any question, you can start typing in the Q&A. Okay, so we have already a question from Augusto Ortega. Cool talk uh, on your uh, heat shock manipulations. So where you disrupt the lumen, is the cell able to restore the lumen if you stop the heat shock? To restore, I guess, the lumen if you stop the heat shock. If yes, do you think that the cell has a regenerative response or lumen formation after you stop the heat shock? Would be similar to embryonic mechanism. Yeah, that's a really interesting question. And I haven't tested that. So um, the heat shock experiments that I showed were done at sort of the late larval stage when the lumen has fully formed to kind of to, to be able to make those measurements. It's nice when the lumen's a bit larger to measure the lumen to cytoplasm ratio. But I think a really great experiment would be to perform the heat shock during the early larval stage when the cell is actively growing out to see if it has this ability to stop and then continue growing. Um, that's a really interesting, yeah. I mean, because one idea is if you block the vesicles by blocking the exosist, for example, 
uh, um, you could probably stop the cell from growing out, but when the protein recovers, is the cell able to respond and continue growing? I would think yes, because you're still gonna have a pool of vesicles. They're just not gonna know where to go for a little while. And eventually they'll figure it out when, uh, the, um, when the ZIF1 protein is no longer present, but it would be a really interesting experiment. Cool. Uh, we have another question from Zainab, very interesting work. I'm curious about the cyst phenotypes you see. Could you comment on why there are cysts forming? Is it because some exocysts are still functioning? And if that is so, I'm wondering what else do you think is regulating them? Yeah, so the, yeah. So when we first did those experiments, one potential thought that we had was that you would get no lumen whatsoever. But as it turns out, when we, like after we saw that there was clearly a lumen, a couple things to point out about that is that the promoter that we're using, it comes on, it appears based on the um, RNA-seq data, it, it seems to come on at a low level very early, but, but by the time the promoter comes on and then it activates the degradation machinery, we think that enough time has passed where a nascent lumen has, has started to form and then you're getting your protein degradation. Um, so that could be, and then I think at that point, since it's an osmoregulatory cell, the lumen, I think, is somehow swelling up with fluid and getting this sort of disorganized cystic structure. And, and the other point that we cannot rule out is these degradation strategies degrade the protein beyond the level of detection. But it's also possible that a small amount of exocyst remains, as was suggested, and that could be sufficient to at least enable this nascent lumen to form. So by no means are we going to claim that it's complete null phenotype that we're seeing. But one thing we would like to test is we, we now have some earlier promoters where we could possibly get rid of these components before the lumen even forms. And would that completely block lumen formation? Um, I think that's also something we, we would like to do. But um, yeah, I think it's very likely that we're getting some, some initial outgrowth before the complete uh, uh, degradation occurs. Great. And then we have another question from Christopher Wright. Uh, would you make some comments about the broad applicability of your model to other systems? Okay, um, so yeah. The, so the, all the proteins that we looked at here are highly conserved, like I mentioned. So um, I think the most obvious application would be in the vascular system. And it would be really great to follow up on some of these components or, you know, collaborate with anybody who's working on zebrafish to try and determine if these similar relationships hold true. Um, so I think it's been understood not only from zebrafish work, but from some electron micro early electron microscopy work um, in uh, uh, mammalian uh, capillaries that, that you, you do actually have regions of single cell tubes within uh, mammalian capillaries as well. So I think for, for us, the most obvious application would be to determine how tiny tubes can actually form within uh, and, and expand with, within a vascular network. Um, and I think the C. elegans just is a great system in order to do this because of its uh, um, you know, optical transparency and, and the genetic tools that, that, uh, that we can use. Perfect. And then we have another question from Gwen, a really nice talk. What do you think about the vesicles? Are they just a way to expand the membrane or do you think they could be delivering specific cargo proteins? Right, that's, yeah, really interesting question. Um, short answer is we don't know. Uh, there was one report by the Gobel lab um, that uh, implicated aquaporin-8 as potentially being carried by the vesicles in order to dump fluid inside the lumen. Um, I think the specifics of that, the, the details of that specific mechanism still remain to be seen, but I think it's, it's a reasonable hypothesis because it's a osmoregulatory cell that it could be uh, dumping fluids inside of the lumen and that could, the fluid expansion could indeed, indeed be one way that it's, it's uh, expanding its diameter. Uh, but beyond that, there's not, um, uh, uh, a whole lot known about what's inside of these vesicles. And uh, one thing that I am also planning to do is to try to do some additional live imaging using FRAP uh, 
to visualize the vesicles um, and their at least get a, get a better sense of uh, vesicle fusion activity during the outgrowth of the cell because I think um, the the EMs have given us so much information, but I think beyond that we haven't had a way to really look at the, the these vesicles live. And um, yeah, I think trying to understand more about them would be uh, uh, is is something we're really interested in. Perfect. Thank you very much. Uh, for the interest of time, I think uh, we should switch uh, to the other speaker. There are, uh, I think, like one more question uh, that uh, you can answer uh, maybe on the chat. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Catherine Criswell. Kate received her PhD from the University of Chicago in Michael Cole's lab. Kate is now a research associate in the labs of Andrew Gillis and Jason Head in the Department of Geology at the University of Cambridge. Kate's research has been focused on the evolution and development of the axial skeleton in geovertebrate. She has received many grants and awards, including the Royal Society Shooter International Fellowship and the National Science Foundation Doctoral Dissertation Improvement Grant. Today, Kay will present her work on hot gene expression and axial regionalization in cartilaginous fishes. Please type your question in the Q&A box and Kay will address them at the end of her talk. Without further ado, I present Dr. Catherine Crisper. All right, um, thank you so much, Chakun, for that lovely introduction. And thank you so much to the organizers of this seminar series for inviting me to talk about my work. Um, so today I'm going to talk about Hox genes and axial regionalization in the vertebral columns of fishes with a focus on cartilaginous fishes in particular. And um, I'm interested in the vertebral column because uh, mineralized vertebrae are a key feature of the vertebrate body form. So, uh, vertebrae provide structural support for the rest of the skeleton, for the head, the girdles, and the limbs and fins. And they also provide protection for soft tissue, like the spinal cord and blood vessels. So if we have a look at a few vertebrae here, there are a couple key components I want to point out that will be useful uh, as we go forward. Um, dorsally, in a vertebra, there's a neural arch which surrounds the spinal cord and a neural spine, which projects dorsally and provides facets and areas for muscle attachment for the axial muscles. Um, medially, there's a centrum, which replaces the embryonic notochord during development. And almost all vertebrates have centra, although a handful of fishes um, keep their notochord into adulthood. And then ventrally, there's a hemal arch and spine, and the hemal arch surrounds the caudal blood vessels and the hemal spine provides additional areas for muscle attachment. And um, this is in tail vertebrae. If we were in the trunk, you would also see transverse processes and or ribs um, articulating to the sides of the centrum. And so today I'm going to talk about axial regionalization. And when I say regionalization, I'm referring to the subdivision of the vertebral column into different sort of categories or units based on changes in vertebral morphology along the axis. So in this cat skeleton here, I've highlighted the five different regions that most mammals have, cervical, thoracic, lumbar, sacral, and caudal. And if you look at, for example, the transition from the cervical region to the thoracic region, you can see it's marked by a clear increase in the neural spine height, as well as the articulation of the pectoral girdle. So it's really clear and easy in tetrapods uh, to identify these regional transitions because um, the vertebrae from one region to the next are so morphologically distinct from one another. And uh, when we're looking developmentally, these different regions are patterned by Hox genes. And Hox genes, of course, are this really interesting group of genes that um, their organization in the chromosomes are reflected in the uh, position and their, of their expression in the embryo during development. So as a, an example here, I've shown the mouse hox clusters uh, A through D and paralogy groups one through 13. And then I've got boxes here showing the somites uh, up top and the vertebrae below. And there's been some really nice work in um, mouse in particular, but also in a handful of other vertebrates showing that some of these hox genes are very key in patterning specific regional boundaries. So for example, the hox six 
paralogy group here um, is expressed up to this um, somite. And those uh, genes pattern the transition between the cervical and the thoracic region. And if you knock out that uh, paralogy group, you'll see a shift in where that regional boundary is located. So if we look across vertebrates, there's this view that's presented often in textbooks of axial skeletal complexity. And it suggests that fishes, um, both cartilaginous down at the bottom here and bony fishes have relatively simple vertebral columns. Uh, they just have essentially a trunk and a tail. And um, there's a, a bit of a kind of a linear hierarchy of complexity culminating with mammals at the top uh, and supposedly mammals have the most regionalized and complex vertebrae and the, the other tetrapod groups, amphibians, reptiles, and birds fall somewhere in between. And it's kind of thought that this axial regionalization that we see in mammals originated with some of the earliest tetrapods. So an example of this would be ichthyostega. This is a, an early tetrapod, one of the earliest from the late Devonian period. So this is about 360 or so million years ago. And in this CT scan, if you look closely, you can see that the vertebral shapes really do change um, pretty noticeably along the body axis. And it's thought that these changes in morphology reflected changes in locomotion. Um, th so these animals were sort of at the precipice of transitioning from aquatic to terrestrial environments. And it's thought that fishes, like I said, have relatively unregionalized axial skeletons. But if we look at a handful of fishes from the literature, there are some examples of fish that have pretty regionalized vertebrae. So this example here is a, a reconstruction of a fossil, Terasius problematicus. This is a ray fin fish, a little bit younger than Ichthyostega. And it has really clear changes in vertebral morphology along the AP axis. And um, the author of this paper, Lauren Salins, suggested that there were five regions very similar to what we see in tetrapods. So if we look at a couple other fishes, living fishes, these are CT scans of a catfish and a bowfin, there definitely are changes in vertebral morphology along the AP axis, but it's not as easy to identify where those region boundaries might fall as it was in the cat skeleton. So the changes in morphology are a bit more subtle and a bit more gradual. So uh, today in my talk, I wanna talk about two different components and it sort of answer two different questions. The first is how regionalized can tetrapod axial or non-tetrapod axial skeletons be? So in fishes, can they have uh, axial regionalization on the order of mammals? And um, secondly, what is the role that Hox genes might play in uh, the development of this axial regionalization outside of tetrapods? So the first place to start um, is to look at some of the very nice expression data we have for uh, some of the more traditional model uh, organisms, zebrafish and mouse. And so I talked about the mouse hox code a little bit earlier, uh, but mice have really clear nested hox expression that is quite staggered uh, along the axis. And a lot of these hox genes in mice align very nicely with uh, region boundaries in the axial skeleton of the adult mouse. But if we look at zebrafish, it's not quite as clear. So in zebrafish, there are fewer vertebrae. And also many of the Hox genes from paralogy groups six to 11 are expressed in a very small region of vertebrae, about six or seven trunk vertebrae. Um, and it, there's very little change in morphology of, of those vertebrae. So it, it makes it really hard to correlate any different um, gene expression boundaries to changes in vertebral shape. Um, and if we look a little bit more broadly across vertebrates, we have some very good data supporting um, the tetrapod relationship between Hox genes and regions from things like chickens and a handful of other taxa. Uh, but it seems like this might be an area where we could really benefit from a look outside the bony vertebrate clade. And um, so this is where my work with cartilaginous fishes comes in. Uh, I'm using the little skate here to help kind of understand what might be going on in other non-bony fishes and what, what might have uh, happened in the evolution of Hox expression at the base of jawed vertebrates. Uh, so the little skate is an oviparous cartilaginous fish. And I do a lot of this work at the Marine Biological Laboratory in Woods Hole uh, down here. 
So skates um, are a relatively uh, useful emerging model organism because they, they lay eggs sort of like a chicken. So there's a single embryo on top of a large yolk in an egg and the skates lay eggs about every week or so. Uh, they're quite slow to develop, so they take about five months from egg laying to hatching. And you can speed this up a little bit if you cool the water down. Um, but they're relatively hardy and amenable to embryological manipulations. So we can do things like cut windows in uh, the egg cases and do dye injections or um, drug treatments, and to some extent, a little electroporation. Um, and they're also very adorable, and they're really fun to work with. Um, so they, as, as a sister group to the bony fishes, they can really give us a lot of information about the evolution of vertebra vertebrate development. I'll wait for this guy to come out. So um, to answer the question about how much regionalization can non-tetrapods have, uh, I started focusing on uh, methods to investigate regionalization in the skate vertebral column that um, might kind of give me more insight than just looking for gross anatomical changes. Because if you look at the skate uh, axial skeleton here, you can see that the vertebral changes along the axis are very subtle. So I use a quantitative approach uh, employing geometric morphometrics. Um, and then this approach, I plotted landmarks on successive vertebrae along the axis and um, used this quantitative method to help identify changes in shape. So I'll run you through how the method works. First, I take those landmarks and I generate a principal components analysis. So um, I started at vertebra 26, and this is because skates have a synarchule at the anterior most part of their vertebral column. And that's about 25 fused vertebrae. And this articulates with the pectoral girdle to provide uh, extra support for their big fin um, movements that they do when swimming. And so I landmarked vertebra 26 to 70, which is well into the tail region. And um, this, the PCA here, it plots, basically shows you the changes in morphospace uh, along the axis. So each line connects one vertebra to the next. I can then take those PC scores and run a regression analysis. So this is a segmented linear regression analysis that iteratively fits regression lines on those PC scores looking for natural breaks in the slope. So I can run this analysis using a one region model, a two region model, a three region model, et cetera. And then I can use maximum likelihood model selection to find out which of those models fits the data the best. So for the skates, we, uh, we recovered a four region model as uh, best fitting for this data set. And if we color code the axial skeleton here, you can see where those region boundaries fall. And I've added the synarchule on as the first region, which uh, suggests we have a five region model, which is uh, really similar to what we see in tetrapods. And I think this is a good example of why this method is really useful, because if you look at the second region here in the green vertebrae and compare those to the blue vertebrae, the change is really, really subtle. And I don't think I could pick out this region boundary just by eye. So, um, this has allowed me to say that, uh, yes, I, I agree with some of those previous papers, uh, fishes can have really highly regionalized axial skeletons, and in particular in the skate, it seems that they have five. So then I looked at Hox gene expression patterns in the skates from paralogy group five to 11. And here is an example of sort of highlights of some of those genes. And I've uh, got dashed lines showing where the anterior most expression in the somites is located. So there's a bit of ex additional expression sometimes in the neural tube, but the dashed line is marking the somites in particular. And I did look from the beginning of somitogenesis uh, all the way to the end. Um, so at four different stages throughout the process um, of somitogenesis. And I found in almost every gene, very consistent expression boundaries. So I can put this expression data back into the phylogenetic tree I showed earlier. And I think to me, it looks like skates have slightly more tetrapod-like expression patterns. So they're nicely nested, but they seem to be a bit more staggered and spread out along uh, the body axis than in zebrafish. Uh, so this suggested to me that perhaps I might be able to uh, identify cor correspondence or relationships between some of these hox genes uh, 
and some of those regions I found in the morphometrics analysis. Um, so to do this, we can't yet in SKATE do any um, really fancy knockout um, experiments. We can't do CRISPR because the eggs have too many cells at the point that they're laid. Um, so I turned to fate mapping to see if um, some dye lineage tracing experiments could kind of shed any light on this. So I designed um, four experiments focusing on different Hox genes along the axis. Uh, Hox 5 and 6, because those two pyrology groups had almost identical expression patterns. Hox 10, and then Hox A11 and D11. So uh, for this experiment, I'll walk you through an example using Hox 10. I counted up the somite number uh, that corresponded to the anterior most expression of uh, the genes in that pyrology group. And then I injected in a live embryo the anterior <laughs> most somite with a lipophilic dye dye I. So dye I binds to the cell membranes, it's passed down very nicely through cell division, and it persists for a very long time in skate embryos. So after a couple months of development, I then did histology to locate the dye in the uh, cartilage of the differentiated vertebral skeleton. So here is a vibratome section in sagittal view with the vertebrae um, highlighted with dashed lines, and you can see where the dye I labeled chondrocytes are. So then I can take the remaining um, bit of the skate axial skeleton and do a skeletal preparation and then count up all the vertebrae to um, sort of identify the eventual, the final position that the somites at that anterior expression boundary um, give rise to. So, um, I, like I said, I did this for four different positions along the axis. For the Hox 5 and 6 pyrology groups, those somites at the anterior boundary gave rise to uh, chondrocytes within the synarchule. So in this box here, you see this big, long, <laughs> kind of continuous chunk of cartilage. That is part of a section through the synarchule. And those were located kind of right, al almost right in the middle um, at the midpoint. For the Hox 10 experiments, those somites were located at vertebrae 33, 34, which is sort of right in the middle of the trunk. For Hox A11, uh, those anterior somites ended up right at the transition from the trunk to the tail vertebrae. And then for Hox D11, those somites um, gave rise to vertebrae that were well posterior in the tail. So I can then take all of these together and um, kind of map out the scaffold there of um, expression of sort of fate mapping results. So you can see Hox 5, 6, Hox 10, Hox A11, and Hox D11. Um, so then to answer that final question, what's the relationship of these Hox expression boundaries in SKATE to these axial regions? I can combine my uh, expression results with my morphometrics results. So here's an expression map showing pyrology groups five through 11 in the skate embryo. And then uh, the differentiated skate axial skeleton showing um, all of the regions from the morphometrics analysis. So one through five in these little rounded boxes. And then uh, each of the vertebrae derived from <laughs> the somites of each of the Hox expression boundaries. So um, the, the main thing to take away from this is that pretty much every region has a Hox pyrology group or a Hox gene uh, that is associated with the anterior most vertebrae. So for example, Hox 9 at region two, Hox 10 at region three, Hox A11 at the beginning of region four. And then a few other things um, that are, I think really interesting that don't maybe jump out as significant right away um, are the position of the Hox uh, 5 and 6 um, pyrology group somites. So those give rise to cartilage right in the middle of the snarkule, but this actually aligns very nicely with the um, articulation of the pectoral girdle, which is exactly what we see in tetrapods. The cervical to thoracic transition is marked by the articulation of the pectoral girdle. So I would suggest that this is also a corresponding um, region boundary, even though it falls in the middle of this set of fused vertebrae.
Uh, and then finally, this little transitional region just before the tail um, in early semitogenesis has no Hox expression, but by the end of semitogenesis, Hox A11, um, the expression domain of Hox A11 has expanded to include the somites that will give rise to those vertebrae. So this suggests that um, Hox A11 might have something to do with uh, the vertebrae, not just at the transition it, itself, but just anterior to it as well. Um, so just to just wrap up, I have a couple conclusions that I've been able to draw from this project. And the first is that uh, fish vertebral columns can be highly regionalized, which is a bit contradictory to the simple view that's in a lot of the textbooks that they consisted of just a trunk and a tail. So I think we, uh, we need to look a bit more closely at fish vertebrae and appreciate how complex they really can be. And finally, a highly regionalized axial skeleton. One million there. Okay, thank you. A highly regionalized axial skeleton that was patterned by Hox genes, I think was likely present in the last common ancestor of jawed vertebrates. So if we're seeing this correspondence in skates and we're seeing it in numerous tetrapods as well, we can, um, we can conclude that it was probably present in the earliest jawed vertebrates. And it seems to me that um, we need perhaps to look at Hox genes in a few other uh, bony fishes to, to see if um, perhaps they have a, a bit more of an interesting story than uh, what we've seen in zebrafish so far. Uh, so I wanna thank you all for listening. And I wanted to thank the two labs I've been working in here in Cambridge. Uh, the one is the head lab and um, this is a paleontology lab. So they've been really helpful for some of the morphological methods and evolutionary questions. And the other lab is uh, the Gillis lab, which works on skate development. And I'll thank some of my funding sources at the bottom. And uh, I'm very happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. All right, thank you, Kate, for the beautiful talk. Uh, please type your question in the Q&A box. Um, I do have one question. Uh, you, in the intro, you mentioned like the bony fish, vegetable fish don't have like this axial regeneration. And you sort of mentioned that maybe in the future it would be better to characterize. Uh, so do you think loss regionalization is also exist or it's probably less a difference somehow between these different little scale versus the bony fishes? Do I think a, a loss of regionalization? Is that what you're asking? Yeah, yeah I think that's, um, this is actually another project I've been working on that I don't, I didn't have time to talk about, but I have been using the, the morphometrics method on a lot of adult fish um, mostly raffin fish, and I found really highly variable results. So some fishes will have just the trunk and the tail, and others will have many regions. And I, so I think, I, I yeah, I definitely think loss of regionalization is um, is one of the things going on. And I think it's probably very flexible in fishes, very labile. Um, they don't have, you know, mammals are known for having much more rigid sort of vertebral numbers in some species. Um, and fishes, I think, probably don't have those constraints. So, yeah, I, but I think that's definitely possible. Thank you. Uh, we do have a question from Dana. Uh, very interesting. Have you tried to look at how regionalization in the vertebral column is linked to the range of motion the scale has as it moves? Yeah, that's a great question. I have not done that in skates yet, but um, for this other fish data set, I have collected, so far I've collected a bunch of sort of ecological uh, parameters, I guess. So things like whether they use their fins or their axial column for locomotion and where they live in the water column. And I haven't analyzed those data yet, but I would, I would expect, I would predict, I guess, that um, fishes that use fin propelled locomotion versus uh, axial undulation would probably have fewer regions or um, less sort of differentiated vertebrae, less um, fewer kind of changes in the morphology than those that use a, their vertebrae for a lot more ac active swimming, if that makes sense. Okay, um, I do have more questions. So in terms of the hog gene families, is in the little scale all the hog genes expressed or is that difference between tetrapod versus the little scales? Are all, sorry, are all the hog genes present like in the, oh. in the yes. Um, so in elasmobranchs, so shark skates and rays, they've lost the Hox C cluster. 
for the most part, I think there, there might be a, a few kind of vestigial remnants out there, but for the most part, they just have A, B, and D. Um, so I'm not sure what um, effect that loss would have on you know, regionalization. I imagine that probably not that much because there's so much redundancy in the other genes, but, but that is one big difference of um, skates to all of the other tetrapod groups. All right, thank you. And we do have a question from Catherine. Hi, Kate. Great talk. I'm more familiar with I'm more familiar with hot genes in flies, but would you predict the same hidden pattern in snakes? Maybe we can check. Oh. <laughs> wow. Um, so this is a, a long a old friend of mine, actually. Um, yeah, so the question about snakes is really interesting um, because the, the method, the morphometrics method I talked about was actually um, originally developed to look at regionalization in snakes. And it was hypothesized originally that snakes had lost regions, um, but using this quantitative method, they were able to identify sort of cryptic regionalization. So I yes, I would predict that um, the the same sort of Hox genes are expressed and aligned with those regions. We just don't have very much expression data for, for snakes at this point. I think, yeah, Hox genes, there are a handful of, of taxa we have expression data for, but it's really patchy. Um, but yes, I would predict the, the same pattern to, to be there if uh, we looked closely enough. All right, thank you. And so I have one question of, in terms of about your future direction. Uh, you mentioned that it's probably difficult to do knockout or using CRISPR in the data scape, but in terms of like whether you can generate transgene to see some of this early uh, patterning. Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, transgenics are really hard because they uh, skates have such a long uh, life cycle. They take so long to mature. So the way that they're um, we collect them at the marine lab is uh, they just collect the adults and the adults can store sperm for months and they'll just lay eggs kind of continuously. And when they run out, um, the, the marine lab just puts them back and get, get, catches new ones. So uh, we, they don't keep any of the same, they don't rear the, the, you know, the embryos up to adulthood because it takes too long. So I think, yeah, unfortunately they're not a great system for things like transgenics or um, any kind of long-term, long um, genetic uh, manipulations. We do a lot of sort of just using drug treatments to knock down pathways and things like that, but that's kind of as sophisticated as we've got at the moment. Okay, uh, all right, thank you. I think I will wake up uh, today's talk. I would like to thank Josh and Kate for your excellent talks. And this seminar has been recorded and will be available on the SDB website starting Monday. Please join us for our next month's seminar on Friday, May 13th, when Margarita Perillo from Brown University and Hector Sanchez Iranjo from Kaju Institute of Technology will present. Thank you all for coming.